Hey, today we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about Kubernetes security. I think this is a topic that comes up pretty often as people think about, I'm rolling out a Kubernetes cluster or many clusters into sort of a production environment. How do I think about actually doing it in a secure way and what are the different security challenges I should be thinking about? And so we're not going to talk about everything today. I think there's a handful of areas that I think are sort of top of mind as we think about Kubernetes security. And many of these might already be familiar to you, right? And so we'll kind of talk about each of these. The first is how do we think about the impact of secrets that our applications need access to in a Kubernetes environment, right? So this might be database credentials, might be certificates, might be API tokens. But how do we think about the security implication of managing and delivering those to apps? Two is, you know, the, our Kubernetes applications rarely live in isolation, right? They have to talk to other applications, other services over a network. So how do we think about the networking controls and restricting which applications are allowed to talk to which other applications or which services can talk to each other. I think that's kind of the second piece of that machine to machine side of it. And the third side is ultimately we're not operating these applications sort of in a vacuum. Our developers, our operations teams, they need access to these environments. So how do we give our developers or our ops teams access you know, in a secure way, right? And so ultimately I think that breaks down sort of the high level set of security challenges that we want to think about as we get started with Kubernetes. So starting with maybe the first one, as we think about the secrets challenge, right? It starts by, great, we have a Kubernetes cluster running somewhere, might be in cloud, might be on premise. And then we have a number of applications running on top of that, right? So application A in this case might be sitting on top. And application A needs access to a database. So great, you know, that application, you know, is going to talk to a database it needs a username and password to be able to do that, right? So it has a username and password or a database credential. So the question is like, where does that actually come from, right? Like how do we securely deliver that to the application? And one of the anti-patterns that we see relatively often is cases where developers are either hard coding that credential as part of the source code of the application. They might be baking it into the Docker container. So it's sort of plain text in the container and you know, visible for anyone who could pull down that container. Or it's sitting in you know, a plain text environment variable or it's a config map or something like that where it's a relatively insecure way of doing it. Even a default Kubernetes secret you know, object is actually just storing the object in plain text at rest right? and has pretty limited RBAC and you know, permissioning around who has access to see that secret. So kind of the first challenge is how do we deliver that in a secure way? And this is really one of the initial problems that Vault was built to solve. So the idea with Vault is that we can actually tightly integrate it with Kubernetes. And so as the application is getting deployed, application A can authenticate with Vault, prove that, hey, I'm application A, I'm running on this Kubernetes cluster. Vault can then have a policy that says, what does that application have access to? In this case, it might be that database credential. And then we can securely deliver that credential to the application so that it can go talk to the database without needing to hard code the username and password or put it in the container or have it in plain text, right? So that's kind of a very basic start point is at least using it to keep for key value secrets. And then we can get much more sophisticated from there. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the vault use cases, but we can get into things like you know, certificate generation on demand or dynamic secrets or encryption key management, et cetera. But the start point is often just the basic secrets and what do we do to manage those securely? Now the next problem is going back to the network controls is often these applications don't exist in isolation, right? There's probably other Kubernetes clusters that we have running different applications, right? So we might have a different Kubernetes cluster running application B, right? And it turns out that A and B need to talk to each other, right? Maybe they're making API calls to one another. Or we might have infrastructure that's not even running on Kubernetes, right? It might be you know, a legacy application running on top of a VM this might be application you know, C running somewhere else. And so these applications are also maybe have a need to interact with one another, right? A needs to invoke B because that's an API for something that it's using, right? So the challenge starts to become, okay, great. How do we manage the networking controls across all of that? How do we define a policy that says A is allowed to talk to B and A is allowed to talk to C, but you know, maybe B and C should not be allowed to communicate to one another, right? In a very traditional approach, what we would have done is put a firewall in between these different services, and then we would have created a set of IP rules to say, hey, you know, the IP running A is allowed to talk to the IP running C. And I think that worked okay in a very traditional environment, right, where it was relatively, you know, called static VM-based workloads where we knew what the IPs were. But as we get into this Kubernetes environment, 
you can see how that starts breaking down, right? All of a sudden, it's a much more dynamic environment. Kubernetes is sort of helping us to enable auto-scaling these applications up and down. We don't actually know what IP the pod is going to be running on until Kubernetes runs it there. If the node dies, Kubernetes will just move the pod to a different node with a different IP address. So it gets very difficult to manage a set of static IP rules, right? Because either we're in this position of every time the pod gets deployed, we have to update the firewall. That's very inconvenient. Or we end up whitelisting the entire subnet that the Kubernetes cluster is running on, at which point the firewall is not adding a whole lot of value. We're kind of letting all the traffic through anyway, right? So I think a common approach as we start thinking about this picture is to apply things like a service mesh, right? So the goal when we talk about solutions like console is to really sit in the middle and enable that type of network connectivity. We want to be able to define a central set of rules that can say A is allowed to talk to B, you know, A is also allowed to talk to C, but B maybe explicitly is not allowed to talk to C. Right? So we want to define these rules at sort of a logical service level. We're talking about the, the name of the service or the identity of the service, not the IP address of the pod. And then we want to automate those controls regardless of where the network is. Right? So we don't care if A might be running in Amazon, B might be running you know, in Google, C might be running on-premise. We don't really care what's the environment, what's the IP. We care about the logical identity of the service. So ultimately, the way this gets translated then as consoles generating a set of certificates, it's automating distributing those to those applications. And then we're enforcing that through a set of proxies running as sidecars on Kubernetes. So in these environments, alongside you know, A and alongside B, we're going to deploy a set of proxies. Those proxies will help automatically wrap the traffic in TLS. So we're going to do mutual TLS between these services. And so that way, when A talks to B, we're using the identity of service A to prove to B that we're you know, it's A talking to it. And likewise, B will use its certificate to prove to A. And then they'll check, is there a rule that says A is allowed to talk to B, yes or no? If so, we'll allow that traffic to go through. If not, we're going to close off that communication. And so that way, we can move away from this world where we need to put firewalls in between all of our services. Effectively, what we're saying is every node is going to enforce that traffic anyway. So we can actually get rid of this and not have to put these in the middle of the network and worry about managing the IPs as the pods come and go. Instead, we define the rules at a logical level and that way, we don't care what's the IP, how many copies of A and B and C are there. They can kind of auto-scale up and down, move around. And these rules end up being the same, and we just enforce them everywhere. So I'm not going to get into a lot of detail there. But I think the key is to think about up-leveling the approach to managing network controls from IP to really thinking about the logical identity of the service and integrating that with either Kubernetes or non-Kubernetes applications. Could be VM-based workloads or you know, Lambda-based workloads, et cetera. And then up-leveling and solving it using a set of certificates and mutual TLS. Now, the last problem of this is, OK, great, but what about our human users? right? My developers, my operators, how do they get access to my Kubernetes cluster to debug things, deploy applications, right? Like actually manage things? So oftentimes, our developers are not on the production network. right? They might be at home, or they're on the, sort of the corporate network. And they need access to this cluster to be able to do things. Right? Now, the most common approach to this is you might say, OK, great, well, we're just going to let everybody either VPN onto the network, or they can SSH onto the network through a Bastion host. And I think the challenge with that is, ultimately, you're giving people a lot more access than they should have to your network. right? Like, great, maybe my developer really only needs access at Kubernetes cluster. But once they're on the network, you know, nothing really stops them from talking to C or you know, talking to services that they shouldn't, in fact, talk to. So this is a very common challenge, which is like we want to give people just enough access to be able to do their job, but not so much access that you know, they have access to the full production network and all the services running on top of it. Right? So this is where we really think about the role of our product boundary, which is to think about, great, we want to run something at the gateway. right? So it runs at the edge of the network, the boundary of the network, if you will. Right? Pun very much intended. And similar to what we've done with console, rather than define a set of IP rules to say which IPs are you allowed to talk to and put a firewall in place and manage that, it's really about the logical services. So we might want to define a set of rules to say, hey, you know what, my developers, you know, they have access to this cluster, you know, the Kubernetes cluster, you know, A in this case, right? And you know, maybe for some reason they also need access to the database so that they can, you know, debug queries and you know, figure out why the performance of something isn't correct. So we're going to define the rule based on the logical identity of the users. Right? In this case, we'll say my development group and the logical identity of the services. Right? We'll say Kubernetes and the database. 
not the set of IPs because those are going to be dynamic and they're going to come and go, right? Application A on Kubernetes, again, highly dynamic. It's coming and going. So my user will prove their identity to Boundary by doing a single sign-on with their identity provider. Maybe that's Okta, maybe that's Azure AD, maybe it's something else. But they're going to do a single sign-on. Based on that, we'll know, hey, that's Armand. He's a member of the development group. What system should he have access to? And then they can request access, and Boundary will directly initiate the connection to whatever the target system is. So it could be Kubernetes, could be the database. Unlike something like a VPN, which is going to put the user on the network, where then they can access everything, Boundary is going to act as a proxy only to the systems I already have access to. So I couldn't ask Boundary, hey, initiate a connection to C, because I'm not authorized to do so. So this starts to give us access and gives us a secure way to let our developers and our operators interface with Kubernetes or interface with applications running on top of Kubernetes without necessarily having to give them full network access to everything. So it lets us start to restrict, basically, and move towards that kind of principle of least privilege where I'm not giving you access to things that you don't really need access to. So taking kind of a step back, right, as we think about Kubernetes, there's many of these different security challenges, right? The first is that the application is running on top of Kubernetes. How do we give them access to secrets, credentials, API keys? That's where we can use a system like Vault and integrate with that to get dynamic secrets, static secrets, et cetera. But then two is as the application's networking with other apps, right? Could be a Kubernetes cluster in a different data center, different region, different cloud. Could be non-Kubernetes applications, VM-based, Lambda, whatever. How do we define the policy that says app A to app B is allowed, right? And that's where console fits in as really more of a service mesh to solve that kind of a challenge, right? Even if we're not worried about the security of it, there's a, simply a discovery problem. How does app A even find app B or app C? So console can even start there by solving a discovery problem and then moving to the security challenge ultimately. And then lastly is about the user access. Our developers, our operators, how do we give them access to these environments in a secure way? And so really moving away from sort of a VPN model or, an, or sort of an SSH bastion model and saying, how do we give you least privileged access to only the systems you should have access to, but do it in a way that's dynamic so that I'm not managing a static set of IPs in these environments. And that's really the goal of Boundary. So hopefully it gives you a little bit of a sense as we're thinking about these different security challenges with Kubernetes different start points to how to start thinking about what those challenges are and different ways of solving those. Hope that was helpful.